Welcome, Dr. Max McLeod here, the Nutrition Ninja Doc. Today I want to talk to you about carbon-60. Learn how a really tiny molecule discovered in space may revolutionize the fields of health, nutrition, and medicine. Why listen to me? Well, I've been intimately involved in the fields of health, nutrition, fitness, alternative, and integrated medicine for over 40 years. So that means I've seen a thing or two, I've worked with thousands of patients. Over that time, I've learned to become very skeptical about all the hype that's so often associated with these fields. And then C60 appeared. This thing is, this stuff is really hype worthy. I truly believe that the potential uses of carbon 60 as a multifaceted biological response modifier is very likely the single biggest positive development I've ever seen come along. It has the potential to absolutely revolutionize and elevate the health of everyone on the planet. Allow me to provide a little bit of history on C60. Back in the early 80s, several very bright chemical researchers were looking for new unique molecules in space. All right, so they weren't actually in space, but that's where they were looking. Amazingly, through a series of interesting events and persistence, they actually found several unique molecules and were able to create them in a laboratory in 1985. One of the molecules they created and identified was C60, also known as carbon-60, a new allotrope of carbon. An allotrope is simply a physical form that an element may exist in. Some elements are known to exist in multiple forms. Carbon is one such element. Here's the discovery team. Harold Croto, James R. Heath, Sean O'Brien, Robert Curl, and Richard Smalley. That's the team that discovered these new molecules in 1985. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1996 was awarded to the remaining members of this group. Note that Nobel Prizes are not given posthumously, so only those that are alive get the prize. Of course, it took some time after the initial discovery to figure out what the newly discovered molecule's structure was. When they finally figured it out, the entire world of science was amazed due to this almost sci-fi shape. As with most unexpected discoveries, a number of their peers were quick to give opinions questioning the validity of both the announcement of the initial discovery and the shape that was later proposed for the new allotrope of carbon. As an aside, bullying and ridicule occur even among the supposedly brightest members of society. In fact, scientists, doctors in particular, and other intellectuals, often use ridicule as their preferred method of bullying. It turns out that C60, or carbon-60, is a sphere that lo looks almost identical to a soccer ball, although it's barely discernible by electron microscopy. It's composed of 20 hexagram and 12 pentagram shaped formations of carbon, just like a soccer ball. Carbon-60 is less than one nanometer in diameter. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. To get a little perspective on how small a nanometer is, let's start with a quick look at this table. Most people are familiar with a meter, just over a yard. Unfortunately, the metric system never really caught on in America. Now, a centimeter is one one hundredth of a millimeter. A millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. A micrometer or a micron is one one millionth of a meter. And a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. That's pretty darn small. Dealing with and understanding really tiny or really large things is challenging on many levels, including our ability to comprehend or visualize them. This diagram from the National Cancer Institute may help to illustrate the relative size of some really small things. Unfortunately, when I decided to cross-check it, it turns out that it isn't 100% accurate. Go figure, most large organizations aren't very good at getting the details right. That goes double for virtually all of the organizations I'm aware of that are focused on major diseases. Most are little more than fundraising scams. A Google search indicates that water is actually about 0.275 nanometers, whereas this chart shows it at 0.1 nanometers. Glucose is about 1.5 nanometers versus 1 nanometers, as the chart indicates, but it still helps put things in perspective. The take-home message is that carbon-60 is smaller than the glucose molecule, but larger than water, the water molecule. The new molecule needed a more formal name. Everything needs a name, and carbon-60 wasn't quite enough. Interestingly, a famous scientist, philosopher, and inventor by the name of Buckminster Fuller designed a structure called a geodesic dome back in 1954 that resembles the shape of C60 very closely. Technically, his dome was constructed of triangles versus hexagons and pentagons, pentagons like C60 is, but when you delve deeper, you'll see that pentagons and hexagons can be constructed from triangles. The scientists who discovered the molecule named C60 in honor of Fuller. Therefore, 
C60 is also called a Buckminster Fullerene, a Fullerene, or a Buckyball. Here are a couple of pictures of Buckminster Fuller with a few of his inventions. In the top picture, he's standing in front of his Dymaxion car, which is really pretty remarkable, and a dome structure based on circles. In the bottom one, he's pictured with his geodesic dome. He's really quite a guy, a real progressive, creative thinker. Now, carbon-60, or fullerene, is composed of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons with a carbon atom at each connecting point of its soccer ball-like structure. And it really is exactly like a soccer ball, although obviously a soccer ball has a, a full casing. This is basically a hollow cage. Beginning in the early 90s, two astrophysicists, Huffman and Kratchner, figured out how to make C60 and other fullerenes in large enough quantities, cost-effectively enough, to make them available for more scientists to study. That significantly stimulated further research. This research has led to the discovery and synthesis of over 1,000 new compounds, many with exciting properties. Over 100 U.S. patent applications have been filed for related discoveries. For example, you may have heard about nanotubes. They're just one of the discoveries that resulted from the research on fullerenes. Carbon nanotubes are tubes made up of carbon hexagons. They range in size from 0.7 to, na to 50 nanometers, and they possess some really unique qualities that make them ideal for several applications. And that's a nanotube pictured here on the left. The various studies with C60 deal with a wide variety of potential applications in multiple fields, including medicine. Of course, as with any new substance, at some point the question arises as to whether there might be some negative or toxic reactions associated with that new substance. That was the question that Professor Fatih Moussa and his team at the University of South Paris set out to study. Basically, they tried to establish how much C60 was needed to kill a rat. That's the standard way of determining if a substance is toxic. It's called an LD50 study designed to find out the lethal dose of a given substance. The Paris study, later published in 1912, uh, I'm sorry, in 2012, it was titled The Prolongation of the Lifespan of Rats by Repeated Oral Administration of C 60 Fullerene. Well, that's not how you'd expect a toxicity study to be titled. It literally, you know, when published in, in 2012, it literally set the C60 medical, nutrition, and longevity research communities on fire. The small study mixed C60 in olive oil and gave it to rats for several months had some alarming findings. Now, if you'd like to read the full, the, the study, the full study firsthand, here's a link to it. Unfortunately, the PubMed version charges you to read the whole thing. This one is free. The experimental group of rats was given C60 in olive oil. They lived 92% longer than the control group of rats. That's earth shattering. Nothing ever studied has come anywhere close to this kind of magnitude of life extension. The study has yet to be replicated and published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal, although a few studies reportedly showing comparable results have been reported by private groups as discussed in various media. Now, regarding the Paris study, it should be pointed out that the rats in the study were not given carbon-60 until middle age, for rats that was about 10 months old. They were treated for just seven months and then observed until they died. So in other words, after the seven months of treatment, there was no further C60 given. Therefore, the beneficial effects of treatment had a significant carryover effect. And again, no signs of toxicity. So how do we account for the results? Numerous studies in C60 have concluded that C60 possesses some very potent antioxidant properties, perhaps the strongest ever discovered. The consensus is that many, the many reported health benefits are due primarily to its ability to quench or neutralize free radicals. It's been estimated to be 172 times stronger than vitamin C and is able to work at several levels of the antioxidant cascade. Everyone's heard of antioxidants, but few really understand what they are and, and how they, they do their antioxidizing magic. If you already know, then skip ahead several, you know, uh, a minute, a couple of minutes. Anyway, for those that don't, let me give you a quick review. Free radicals are simply the result of various chemical reactions where a molecule loses an electron, leaving it with a highly reactive unpaired electron in its outer valence shell. And don't stress if you're not sure what I'm talking about just yet. There are many things that cause free radicals to be formed. So this diagram might be helpful. 
On the left is a normal oxygen molecule just minding its own business when, bam, one of the electrons gets ripped off. You know, kind of like a molecular pickpocket comes along and pulls it away. So this loss of an electron means that the oxygen molecule has been radicalized because it now has a free unpaired electron in its outer orbit. It's pretty simple. Free electron, radical. So it's free radical. Free radicals are simply a result of normal metabolic processes in a world full of oxygen and nitrogen. In our world, virtually all life depends on redox reactions. Redox simply stands for reduction and oxidation reactions, which are coupled. These electrochemical reactions are what allow organisms to process and use oxygen to create energy for life. There are energy producing pathways that don't involve oxygen, but they account for less than 10% of our energy needs. Now, the newly created free radical will then steal an electron from somewhere else. This will be repeated many times, each causing some degree of damage to the associated tissue. Now think of it like dominoes. You just knock one over, and that pushes another one, and then another. It's the same idea. It's a cascade, uh, the domino effect of one free radical that steals an electron from another substance that then, you know, it completes that free radical, but then it creates another free radical, and it goes on and on and on. So here, here's another analogy that I kind of like. Let's say there are a bunch of kids playing uh, with a variety of toys, and, and they're all content and, 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 you know, focused on their particular toy and what they're doing. And all of a sudden, one of the kids misbehaves. It's probably because he had a crappy lunch with, you know, lots of sugar and food coloring or whatever. Um, so it kind of messes his mind up, and then he decides to, to go and grab someone else's toy. So what happens next is pretty easy to guess. The kid who just had their toy taken away gets very upset and reacts by crying, yelling, and taking someone else's toy. Can you imagine how this might spread until the entire room is in up, an uproar? That's basically what free radicals do. Now, logically and luckily, the body has developed elaborate systems to limit the damage and destruction caused by free radicals. It uses several specialized enzymes and ingested antioxidants to neutralize free radicals, thereby preventing or reducing the damage. An antioxidant is simply a molecule that has an extra electron that it can donate to the free radical to complete the outer ring, thereby pairing the unpaired electron with another electron. Balances it out. Now, in the previous analogy, think of the antioxidant as a magical fairy that goes around giving each kid another toy, thereby satisfying them. Okay. In addition to the various antioxidants available, mostly consumed in the diet, the body has evolved several enzymes that inactivate free radicals. These are especially active in places that the dietary antioxidants can't get to. The diagram, this diagram, shows several members of the body's free radical defense system and where they're active. Vitamin E is active in the cell membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus, and DNA. Beta carotene is active in both the cell membrane and the endoplasmic reticulum. Catalase is active in the peroxisomes. Copper and zinc work with superoxide dismutase, glutathione, glutathione peroxidase, and vitamin C in the cytosol. Manganese, vitamin E, SOD, the superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and glutathione are all active in the mitochondria. These are the cell's power generation stations where oxygen is directly used. Glutathione peroxidase also works in the cytosol. And finally, at least for this diagram, vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene all work in the lysosomes. Now, C60 or carbon 60 also appears to be a major toxin sponge. So it picks up a variety of toxins, holds them, and pulls them out of the body as it leaves. Now, I haven't personally seen a lot of studies that have focused on C60's ability to remove toxins, but I did come across one that showed it does bind to and remove mercury. That, my friends, is huge, as anyone familiar with how widespread and damaging mercury toxicity knows. Studies thus far indicate that C60, once absorbed into the body, leaves the body in 10 to 96 hours or thereabouts. Now, the big question is safety. Unfortunately, most people's crystal balls don't work reliably. At least I can guarantee that mine doesn't. So no one really knows whether there might be some long-term safety issues even though the Paris study indicated no. You know what? If it helped me live twice as long, or even 50% longer in good health, I'll take my chances. Let's face it, there are benefit to cost ratios with 
everything. The key point thus far is that they literally tried to overdose and kill the poor unsuspecting rats in the Paris study with C60, but they lived twice as long as any rat ever. And not one of the experimental rats developed tumors or died of cancer. That's huge when you realize that virtually all rats used in research are bred to develop tumors and die of cancer. As an aside, it kind of makes you wonder if they've been doing the same thing with humans over the past hundred or so years. As you know, the cancer rates have exploded. Now, the take-home message is that absolutely no toxicity has been associated with C60 itself in any of the studies to date. Some do speculate, however, that there could be some potential yet to be determined toxicity identified at some point in the future. Of course, that statement is true of just about everything, and it's virtually impossible to definitively confirm that a substance does not have some potential negative side effects over a prolonged period of time. One more thing I'd like to say about this. I've recently come across a video from a very prolific, often informative herbalist, I believe he is, stating that C60 is toxic to DNA. He believes it to be related to the giant global conspiracy to control our minds and make us all into slaves. And I don't say that to ridicule him at all. It's just to give you some perspective. Personally, I do believe there are quite a few real conspiracies out there, but I'm not the least bit convinced that C60 plays a role in any of them. Okay, back to C60 and potential DNA damage. There was a study that showed that C60 can interact with DNA due to its size and all. The study authors speculated that this interaction could possibly have some deleterious effects. I just wanted to put that out there. But upon careful reading of the study, it appears to me to be wild ass speculation, more so than anything probable. Something many researchers are prone to. I guess it helps them get more funding or something. All right, there's a lot more information that I can share about my research on C60 based on my understanding of health, physiology, nutrition, etc. But I'm not going to go on here. This video is already long enough, although I do plan to do a part two sometime soon. My goal is to get some solid usable information out as soon as possible, since I have yet to see a video on carbon 60 from anyone with any actual healthcare or medical background. I'll do more videos on C60, especially now that we have our own version in production. But you may want to get my free report on C60. It includes everything in this video and a lot more. So if the information you've heard so far on carbon 60 intrigues you and you'd like to learn more from someone that was actually trained as a physician and worked in the health field, then click on the link in the description of the video. It'll take you to the page to plug in your email address and the report will automatically be sent to you. I'll also try to figure out how to put you on a list for future notifications about C60 and related topics. By the time you see this, I should have our new C60 product listed on our website at mybodysymphony.com. If not, and you'd like to try a bottle, feel free to email me at doc at mybodysymphony.com. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Whether you choose our C60 product or not, I definitely believe that you should give one or more of the C60 products out there a try. As with anything, do your best to observe any changes you might feel. Now, not everyone, not everyone feels changes. If you're already healthy and have no signs or symptoms, then you're less likely to notice anything, although I, it should still be working in the, in the background to improve your health. Of course, all this information was for educational purposes and should not be construed as medical advice. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you on the next video.